Even though I've done almost 800 MTG top 10s at this point, I've never thought to take a look at an exact mana cost. But Everin Etch suggested I do exactly that in a comment, and it's a great idea, at least for one exact mana cost in particular that there's been a lot of buzz about lately. Wizards of the Coast keeps printing really strong cards that cost one generic, a blue, and a green. As a result, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at that exact mana cost, so we can really get a feel for how powerful cards with that cost really are. In this video, we'll look at the 10 cards that cost exactly one generic, a blue, and a green that have found the most success in Magic's highest level of competition. This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I rank cards in these videos. I use a scoring system where a first tier top 8 is worth 2 points, this includes events like Pro Tours, and a second tier top 8 is worth 1 point, this includes events like Regional Championships. At number 10, it's Edric, Spy Master of Trest. For one generic, a green, and a blue, and that's the last time I'll say that in this video since it will get really repetitive, he's a 2-2. And whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may draw a card. Obviously, in 1v1 games, this means that any time one of your creatures hits your opponent, you get to draw a card, and it counts each individual creature, so there's a lot of potential here. By virtue of only being printed in Commander sets and Conspiracy, the only 60-card formats Edric is legal in are Legacy and Vintage. All of his points came in the former between 2011 and 2017, during which time he appeared in bug mid-range decks in the format. Generally, a singleton copy was used, so it could be grabbed with Green Sun Zenith, because if you get Edric down at the right time, he can give you insurmountable card advantage. These decks had lots of evasive creatures in general, so Edric wasn't too shabby in your opening hand either. However, Edric hasn't gained any points since 2017. At number 9, it's Bounding Krasis. It's a 3-3 with Flash, and when it enters the battlefield, you may tap or untap target creature. So, flashing in the Krasis can result in a big swing in combat, between adding a significant body to the board itself and untapping another creature. Alternatively, you can use it to tap a problematic attacker before combat or a problematic blocker at the end of your opponent's turn. While in Standard it was featured in Collected Company decks, which could put the Krasis into play from the library at an opportune time for that Enter the Battlefield ability, but the Krasis hasn't made the transition to Collected Company decks in other formats and hasn't gained any points since 2016. At number 8, it's Trigon Predator. It's a 2-3 with flying, and when it deals combat damage to a player, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment that player controls. This can represent a very real threat against opponents' reliance on cards with those types, as it can really wreak havoc on your opponent's game plan. It was so good at dealing with those types of cards, in fact, that it was played in the Eternal formats between 2009 and 2014. In those formats, playing the Predator on turn 1 or 2 was very doable, and most decks play cheap artifacts in the early game, so it would be able to have a huge impact on most games if left unchecked. The Predator hasn't gained points since 2014, though, as there are simply better creatures to fulfill this kind of role in those formats, including creatures with Enter the Battlefield abilities like Reclamation Sage, or if you want a potentially repeatable way to destroy those types of permanents, you can go with Outland Liberator, which can do the same thing when it transforms. Because we keep on getting cards that cost one generic, a blue, and a green, all three of the cards at the bottom of this list are in danger of falling off of the list in the future, as none of them have seen play in quite some time. At number 7, it's Slogurk the Overslime. It's a 3-3 with Trample. Whenever land is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you put a plus and plus one counter on Slogurk. You can also remove three counters to return it to your hand, and when it leaves the battlefield, you return up to three land cards from your graveyard to your hand. So, yeah, Slogurk really likes lands going in the graveyard. He's particularly powerful alongside the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty Channel lands, which he's been played alongside in Standard, Modern, and Legacy. These lands give you spell-like effects and go directly to the graveyard, which buffs Slogurk, and you can always get them back by returning Slogurk to your hand. That's a pretty insane value engine, and that's what has allowed Slogurk to make an impact on three different formats. He's likely to keep gaining points in the future, but that's true of almost every single card in front of it too, and it's gaining points at a slower rate than most of them, so number 7 might just be the best Slogurk can ever do on this extremely stacked list. At number 6, it's Nadu Winged Wisdom. This is the card that has led many to point out that Wizards of the Coast has a hard time balancing the power level of cards with this mana cost, and indeed, Nadu is a brand new card from Modern Horizons 3, and it's already done a ton of work. It's a 3-4 with flying, and it gives all of your creatures a super insane triggered ability. 
Whenever one of them becomes targeted by a spell or ability, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you put it onto the battlefield, otherwise you put it into your hand. This ability triggers only twice each turn. Note that this triggers regardless of who controls the ability, and therein lies the problem. You can target your creatures with your own stuff, like repeated activations of Shuko or Outrider and Core, and as long as you're making new bodies to target with something like Springheart and Antuko, or as long as you're resetting Nadu's trigger by playing another Nadu, you can draw your entire deck while adding tons of bodies to the board, and at that point it's pretty easy to win. Nadu decks absolutely crush Pro Tour Modern Horizons 3, with five of the top eight decks built entirely around the combo, and Nadu decks are making noise in Legacy and Vintage too. In fact, the deck is so good in Modern, reminiscent of the days of Hogok and Oko in the format, that there's a pretty good chance it ends up on the ban list. If it doesn't, Nadu has a pretty legitimate chance at ending up very high on this list, as even among cards with this mana value, it's a powerhouse. Even if it does get banned, Nadu is going to keep doing work in Legacy, and maybe Vintage too. At number 5, it's Risen Reef. It's funny, when people have been talking about how broken this mana cost is lately, this elemental often gets left out, but it shouldn't. It's pretty darn good too. It's a 1-1, and when it or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, you look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you can put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put it onto the battlefield, put it into your hand. Sure, this does pale in comparison to Nadu's trigger, but it's still pretty strong and adds tons of value to every single elemental that enters the battlefield, as you end up netting a card every single time one does, and sometimes you ramp your mana too. It's been the linchpin in elemental decks in multiple formats since being printed. While it only found modest success in Standard and Pioneer, it's been really successful in Modern, especially after the elemental incarnations got printed in Modern Horizons too. These elementals all have powerful enter the battlefield abilities that you can get for free by pitching cards, and they get even better when you tack on the Risen Reef trigger, which will go off whether you evoke them or cast them normally. At their best, these decks used Yorion to really abuse a bunch of enter the battlefield triggers, but unfortunately for Risen Reef, the modern banning of Yorion in 2022, and then of Fury in 2023, has weakened elemental decks in modern significantly, to the point that they aren't really major players in the format anymore. It is likely to gain some more points here and there in both Pioneer and Modern, but the days of its dominance are likely over. And number four, it's Rogue Refiner, another super powerful card with this mana cost that seems to get overlooked, although in this case it makes a little bit more sense, as this card was really only a powerhouse in Standard. It's a 3-2, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and you get two energy. That's a ton of value for the cost, and it felt pretty darn close to a 3-for-1 in Standard, since those two energy it gave you could be spent on all kinds of effects worth an entire card. The Refiner played a big role in making energy decks entirely dominant in Standard, and it ultimately got banned out of the format as a result. So far, it hasn't really broken into any of the modern energy decks that take advantage of the Modern Horizons 3 energy cards, partly because the best energy cards from that set aren't in blue or green, but it isn't completely out of the question that it gains some more points in that format with energy, suddenly a very real archetype there. At number 3, it's Shardless Agent. It's a 2-2 artifact creature with Cascade, which means that when you cast it, you exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. You can then cast that non-land card without paying its mana cost. And then you can put the exiled cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. In other words, casting Shardless Agent usually means you get a 2-2 body plus some cheap spell, and you almost always get 3 mana worth of value or more. Shardless Agent was originally printed in Plane Chase 2012, which meant that it was only legal in Legacy and Vintage. It made the most of its Legacy legality, showing up in Sultai mid-range decks that were sometimes partially named for it. These Shardless Bug decks were a big part of Legacy between 2012 and 2017. Then in 2021, it received a reprint in Modern Horizons 2, giving the agent legality in Modern for the first time. Since then, it's been played in Modern decks that seek to abuse Cascade, in particular in decks that cast Crashing Footfalls and Living End. If you build your deck correctly, you Cascade into one of these every single time you cast a Shardless Agent, and that's pretty powerful. Footfalls decks have proven to be strong enough for Legacy 2, so Shardless Agent is racking up a ton of points right now, but so too are the two cards in front of it. At number 2, it's Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Uro is a 6-6, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain 3 life and draw a card, and you can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. If it didn't escape, you sacrifice it right away. It escapes for 2 green and 2 blue, and you also have to exile 5 cards from your graveyard. When you do that, you can cast it from your graveyard. So early in the game, Uro is effectively a 3-mana explorer that gains you 3 life, 
Not a bad deal if you're looking to ramp, especially because the stuff it does early makes it more likely you'll survive to the later game. Gaining life and drawing a card is a big deal, and if you're surviving more to the later game, that means you're probably going to escape it later. At which point, Uro starts to do this every single turn. So Uro is incredibly powerful, and, as a result, it has had a large impact on several different formats. In Standard, it was utterly dominant, showing up in the top two decks of the format, which were Bant and Sultai Ramp. It was the most played non-land card at several different Standard events, contributing to a huge score that came only in a matter of months. Uro also found success in other formats, too, and ultimately it ended up being banned out of Standard historic pioneer and modern this has caused it to slow down but it's also being played in legacy and vintage so it isn't completely done however it's never going to catch the number one card on the list and that card of course is oko thief of crowns he's a four loyalty planeswalker who can make a food token with his plus two turn an artifact or creature into a three three with no abilities with his plus one and he has a minus five that lets you exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls with power three or less Oko is probably the best Planeswalker ever printed. While all his abilities are good, his plus one ability is really where the power is. It's incredibly flexible, capable of either downgrading opposing permanents or making your permanents better, including the food Oko can make himself. Oko was immediately a huge problem seeing heavy play in every single format. He was the most overpowered in Standard, where he was only legal for about two months and yet managed to gain 60 points in the format. The peak of his dominance came between August 8th and 10th, of 2019 when he was in 18 of the 24 decks to top 8 premiere events. He was ultimately banned out of standard pioneer, historic, modern legacy, and even brawl. These days he is still legal and vintage and he sees a ton of play there and that's going to continue. So despite all those bans, I think Oko will hold on to the number one slot on this list. So those are the best cards with a mana cost of one generic, a blue, and a green. It's certainly a very impressive mana cost. If you're interested in seeing me look at some other specific mana costs, let me know which ones in the comments. If you're trying to build a blue-green deck, you probably want some of the cards on this list. If so, check out the description where you can find a Direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. Thanks for watching.